This is Take Fountain. I'm Bill Getty. I'm here with my partner, Tom Mount, as always. And as always, we're talking about the origins of certain things in show business, whether it's television shows or movies or careers or so on. And today we are here to talk about Otter and Bluto and Pinto and D-Day and Niedermeyer and Dean Wormer and all those characters from what turned out to be an extremely important and raunchy and silly movie called Animal House, which you developed very early on. I'm guessing because if because this is Animal House is something like 78 ish, right? Released in 78. Released. So you shot it a year before. Right. You're very pretty new at being a big boss there at, uh, at Universal. Am I right? I think that's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. I inherited the origins of Animal House from a a very nice guy. I'm sure I never met him except once, which was to fire him when right. I first went to work at Universal. Wait, they made you fire the guy that you were replacing? Yes, that was sort Who of... Who does that? Uh, people at Universal. Um, <laughs> they, Mr. Wasserman ran a very, very tight ship, but right. all of his executives were, shall we say, combat-oriented. Right. And I've seen executives faint in meetings and I've seen people yeah. turn desks over and throw things across rooms and yeah. a lot of stuff like that yeah. in any event. I've seen a lot of crying. Yeah, crying Lots is, of crying. Crying is big. Yeah. So this guy, Jerry Miller, had some projects he was developing. My immediate boss at that time was a man named Ned Tannen, now deceased too bad because he's super smart yeah. and funny and outrageous. So, so in any event, yes. uh, Jerry Miller had some projects in development. Tannen said, throw them all away, we'll get rid of them. I went through all the stuff. Most of it was not exciting, but one of them was a treatment, a very brief treatment adapted from a National Lampoon magazine piece by Chris Miller called Night of the Seven Fires. Night mm. of the Seven Fires. That doesn't even sound vaguely familiar. No, it's not, because it never got made. What did get made was Animal House, which was derived, at least in part, from Night of the Seven Fires. Okay. So Night of the Seven Fires had a central theme, which was... Uh, drunken frat boys extinguish ritual fires on a mountainside at Dartmouth College by throwing up on the fires. Ooh. Yeah. So That was the basis for Animal House. That was at least a basis for a piece of Animal House. Okay. So we went back to, I went back to Maddie Simmons, who at that time was the publisher of the National Lampoon. I should parenthetically say that Simmons... Uh, was a kind of lovable villain in the Lampoon world. The writers all hated him and loved to prank him and treat him badly. And he was actually a pretty nice guy. Um, but he was around a bunch of arrogant ex-college maniacs, all of whom went to Harvard, and who had, shall we say, attitude. So they were Harvard Lampooners. So, so, so they wrote for the Harvard Lampoon, and which is, so I assume that the Harvard Lampoon was the origin of National it Lampoon? Was, it was the origin to the extent that when Doug Kinney and Harold Ramis and Chris Miller left the school, they made a deal with the school to create a national magazine called National Lampoon, not Harvard Lampoon. And Maddie then bought that magazine because they couldn't figure out how to make it work and how to make it make money. So Maddie came in and, and took it over. In any event, Night of the Seven Fires we started redeveloping and when I say we I mean the three writers Doug Kinney who was a genius and who ended up playing Stork in the movie right and Harold Ramis who is better known for his work as an actor and writer in things like Ghostbusters but Groundhog Day and Groundhog all stuff. Day yeah, great exactly. stuff Harold yeah. also smart as hell and yeah. a wonderful guy and Chris Miller who always described himself as the typist mm -hmm. in the group and this of course undercuts the truth, Chris Miller was the origin of all this. Right. And while everybody contributed their own college stories, including other people who came on board later, Ivan Reitman and others had stories from college and we tried to integrate everything. Ultimately, this script uh, came together. It took a couple of years of work, which is not unusual. No, well, and also, I, I think it's interesting to put yourself in, uh, this movie came out when I was in college at the University of Texas, so I'm the audience right now for this movie, because that's, right. that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, I, I, was, I remember this. 
this. I don't know if you can, you can see this where if I'm, I'm holding this up properly. Yes. This, this is a very famous magazine. By the way, it's $4.95, which I was shocked that it was that expensive all those years a ago. Fortune, that's 1974. Yeah, that's a lot of magazine. dough for that. Uh, but a very famous cover. And yes. I remember reading this. I remember with my buddies reading the foreigner issue of National Lampoon repeatedly. Things that you'd get arrested for if you uh, wrote them today, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and matter of fact, you probably would get in trouble with this movie and you couldn't make this movie today but once upon a time there were no such things as r-rated comedies correct and this is sort of the breaking a barrier am i am i correct well it's definitely breaking a barrier i think what really happened here is that animal house was the bellwether of the shift in the culture right the 60s kids finally had a little bit of power i had some power at a studio i was in my 20s i could make a movie happen yeah uh, on a limited basis with a lot of struggle and a yeah. lot of older guys telling me to shut up and sit the sure. fuck down, you mm -hmm. know, but I could still get it done. It also and helped that this was a cheap movie, right? Well, everything cheap. I was I mean, not cheap. I mean, it was, it was small. It was like, you weren't, you weren't going <laughs> to, you weren't, you weren't going to break the bank with this film. Yeah, I wasn't making $50 million movies right. yet. Right. Um, and, and this movie cost $3 million to make. Amazing. And by the way, the movie we I had done prior to this, a, a good example, was a movie called Car Wash, on which I was allowed to spend $1 million right. to make Car Wash. So it was considered a these kind are, of mid-range thing. These are major return on your investment monies, which we'll get to in a minute. But uh, so, so you're developing this script, and, and the script is full of things that... I'm sure uh, the nice, uh, relatively conservative uh, uh, gentleman at Universal might have found offensive. Am I correct? I think a lot of them found it offensive. I was brought into Universal and championed by a man named Lou Wasserman, who was the right. chairman of the company and for many, several decades, the most powerful guy in Hollywood for good reason. He was smarter than everybody else and he was more determined than everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Wasserman asked me to do some things. He asked me to make some pictures in the beginning, some black motion pictures. Right. Obviously, there were very few, almost no black people in Hollywood in those days. Yeah. So we built a black film unit, which ultimately ran around, organized around people like Richard Pryor and, and uh, a number of, of other writers and directors. The about Animal House ultimately is that it was for me it was the threshold picture that kind of separated Universal from its past right Universal had been making uh, Gable and Lombard yeah they'd been making uh, yeah. you know movies about Midway movies sure. about World War II yeah. battles and they things. were still caught up in the the uh, legacy of, of classic films they were and yes. they had no idea and the culture had shifted and so right. I decided look it was a miracle that I had this job to begin with. Yeah. I had no expectation that I could get a job at a studio, let alone end up running one. Right. And, and so the idea here was, we'll all get fired soon enough. Let's just do everything we can <laughs> Why not? Right. before they find us. If they catch us, they'll throw I, us out. I, 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 when I think of, of this movie, when, I, when we first started talking a year ago about maybe doing this sort of thing, and you said, you know, I, I developed a... Animal House, and I went like, Animal House wasn't some little independent. I mean, I, th I always thought of it was being like one of those films that some kids got together and made, and it just made a fortune, like you know, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something. Right. I thought it was that kind of movie. Right. To 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 discover that it was developed at Universal Pictures, I was I don't know you know I didn't know anything about that at that time in my life. I was in college. That's fascinating in and of itself to run that sort of raunchy movie up the ladder and get it released. Well, and my boss, Ned Tannen, my immediate boss, um, who I can't say enough good things about, he was so smart. He also happened to be what we would call today bipolar. Uh -huh. So that on Monday and Tuesday, everything was great and fine. And on Wednesday, I had to fire everybody and shut down every picture. Right, right. So it was a complicated relationship. In any event, uh, there were many things about this script that we ultimately got from the guys in New York, and they worked their ears off, and I flew into New York frequently to work with them, and, and I had a second-in-command named Sean Daniel, who's a terrific producer and a great guy, one of my classmates from CalArts. When I got this job at Universal, there was nobody in the company under 50. 
I was 23 yeah. when I started there. So, Bill, I had to find some homies to hang out with. And well, so the minute I could hire anybody, right. I started hiring my classmates. Sure, right. Bruce Berman, great yeah. guy, ended up running Warner Brothers and then running Village Roadshow for many, many yeah, years. Sure. Sean Daniel produced a bunch of great films, Ren Universal after I left, a bunch of other stuff. Um, and a bunch of other people, some really smart women that we stole entirely from book publishing. Now, this is, ends up being a, um, a, a, a Landis, a John Landis uh, It picture. ends up that way, but it doesn't start that way. How, so, well, how, how, I mean, me, because, because what's interesting to those of you who say, oh, I know John Landis, he did all these great movies with Bill Murray and whatever, you know, right. and, uh, and none of which are coming to my mind right now. Well, Maybe Trading Places might be one. One of those sorts of things. Yeah. And, and, but at this time, he's nobody, basically. Right. He's right. no, he's nobody, and he and he wants to be on this picture. How does he get on the picture when he's done basically nothing? Okay, so several things are going on here. One is there was a little clique of filmmakers coming out of Cal Arts. I'd gone to graduate school there. Sean had gone there. We knew a girl named Lee Hambro, who, by the way, parenthetically, her father Lee Hambro was um, a concert pianist and a stunning one, New York Phil first piano. Right. And he was part of the music school at Cal Arts. I say this only because he also had an amazing sense of humor, and his daughter was, uh, shall we say, utterly inappropriate in all the great ways. <laughs> and so, so uh, she said, first to Sean and then to me, she said, there's this guy, John Landis, and he's making this movie called Kentucky Fried Movie, yeah. and pieces of it will be really funny, and you should get a look at it. You should see what he's doing. In the meantime, I'm working from a director list handed to me by Ned Tannen, and he said, go get Bob Rafelson. So I check with Bob Rafelson, he's not available. Go yeah, get, I can't imagine Bob Rafelson I, doing this movie. Please, let's not go there. Five easy pieces and things like that. That doesn't seem like a fit at all, but yeah. carry on, all right. And then go get this guy and go get that guy. And finally, one day Ned said, and by the way, this is after we have struggled for years on this script, and it's great. And it needs still a little work like every script, but it's, it's in the ballpark of a great movie. Mm -hmm. Parenthetically, I should say here that that script came into my office. I was in London having a distribution meeting on behalf of the company with our international distributors. My secretary, Seal Burroughs, who worked with me for 25 years and was a wonderful woman and still around at 100 years old, still calls me to tell me that I'm not doing the right thing every day and I need to straighten up. <laughs> um, so uh, Seal called me in London and said, I just got fired. And I said, well, that's interesting. Who fired you? She said, well, Jennings Lang, who was a very senior executive, good friend of Wasserman's, had been at the agency before, Lou bought Universal, all of that. Jennings had heard that the, good, the script came in and it was good, so he wanted it so he could produce it. Yeah. So he demanded the script, and she said, no. Tom told me I can't release the script without his approval. And he said, well, then you're fired. And so I said, pack your stuff and go home. You'll be back in the office tomorrow. And I got on a plane. I came back to Los Angeles. So all of a sudden, this script is a hot property. Inside People the are starting to feel it. Inside the company, there's a rumor that this script might be good, but I won't let anybody read it because right. I know these guys. And I know and how they won't be able it. to read it. Well, they, not only will they hate it, not only will they think it's way out of line in almost every way, right. if they like it, they'll take it away from me completely and screw sure. it up. Yeah. Next thing I get is a call from Ned saying, I've got the perfect director. His name is Jim Frawley. Jim Frawley is a very nice man. Mm. His big credit in life was, at that time, having directed the Monkees television show. Ah, yes. Which was not famous for wit or edgy intelligence, right. or humor that actually was side-splitting. Yes. And so... And this is side-splitting, this movie. I was afraid that if I submitted this script to Jim Frawley, he would say mm. yes, because Ned wanted me to call him and attach him. Right. I sent the script to Frawley's house by messenger, and I called him on the phone. And I know the guy slightly, well enough to talk to him. And I said, Jim, listen, I'm calling you because I'm deeply embarrassed. Tannen has asked me to send you this script, and I think it's substandard material. I think it's beneath <laughs> you. I know you want to direct the feature. I know you're going to do that. Oh, you Hollywood guys. I know, <laughs> I know. I know you're going to go somewhere great, but I just 
<laughs> don't, I don't want to be tarred and feathered by no, you. No, no, this for is sending so you beneath you. Piece yes. of junk. Yeah, it is be utterly not this beneath kind me. Of yeah. Riff raff. Yeah. And so, <laughs> Farley called me a few days later and said, "You know, I agree with you. The picture's terrible. It's vulgar. It's stupid. Yes. There's nothing interesting Absolutely. about it." Absolutely. And great. So then I said to Tannen, "We've got to hire this guy Landis." Mm-hmm. By that time, I'd seen a few minutes of Kentucky Fried Movie. Remember, it's a uh, serial of different Oh, I loved it. Uh, I, I remember it very well. Again, right. another college film. Yes. When I'm in college, yes. it has the, it has the uh, martial arts thing in it. Yes. It has, uh, it, I, I, I can see some of these sketches, really raunchy right. stuff. And Landis didn't direct the whole movie. He directed segments. Yeah, the right. There were several right. directors. Right. And so... And the Zuckers, really, this was the start of their lives. They put that movie That's together. right. Independently yeah. financed. Yeah. yeah. And so John is trying to finish that, his piece of that movie. And I look at what John's done, and I know Ned Tannen by now very well. Mm-hmm. I've worked very closely with this guy for a long time. So I say to John, edit down about eight or ten minutes, no more than that, because Tannen has no attention span. Mm-hmm. And then make sure you include naked girls, Make sure you include a couple of physical sight gags that will make people laugh out loud. Mm -hmm. Cut that together and take it to... This uh, is not a time for subtlety, is what you're saying. Room number one at Universal, and I'll get Tannen down there to look at it. Right. So after just bugging him to death, I drag him down to room one. We watch this little piece of film that John has put together, and he walks out after two-thirds of it or by after he sees the naked girls go Mm -hmm, by mm -hmm. he gets up and walks out i follow him out he says yeah that guy's good he's (laughs) funny he can make a movie (laughs) i said great so now we have john landis who by the way went to work with the writers on the script again and lifted it up another full another level john is really smart yeah 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 john's great he's a very smart guy he's a very thoughtful guy and better than that he loves movies yeah and in the shooting and in the his development stage on animal house john had in mind the marx brothers he had in mind harold lloyd sure he had in mind classic tropes from the movie business that always work if they're transliterated into a new context well the movie is i don't know how to put it it's so stupid it's smart yes you know it's like it's so knowingly idiotic well, you know what I mean? In the it, opening sequence, as you remember, the camera pans down on the statue of Emil Faber, the yes. founder of Faber College, right. and the legend on the plaque says, knowledge is good. <laughs> yeah. Great quote. Great quote. <laughs> and we couldn't agree more wholeheartedly. Knowledge is good. Now, I, I think of this as, you know, uh, I can't figure out, I guess Belushi has already been on SNL. Am I right or am it's, I wrong? No, he's, I think, in the second or third season on second SNL. Second or third season and, on SNL. And they are still the not ready for primetime players. Nobody right. has a screen credit yet. Yeah, exactly. So he's not, he's not a movie star, but he's a standout on that show. That's correct. How does, is, uh, how did he become involved in it? Uh, not to paint, paint Ned Tannen as a constant roadblock, but Ned was a constant roadblock. Yeah, okay. And so there's several things going on here. Uh, First of all, that role he wanted a star in, and the only person he thought was a star was Chevy Chase. I thought the idea of putting Chevy Chase in that role was death, and good news is so did Landis. Yeah. And we thought, and I like Chevy Chase, he's a nice guy, and he's talented, but totally wrong for that role. That needed John Belushi. But in getting John Belushi, the trade-off was this. Ned said, okay, if you're going to use this unknown guy, first of all, you can't pay him anything. Right. So that was easy. We paid John $35,000 to do that role. $35,000, I assume no points or anything. No, cash U.S. money, $35,000. Wow. How about that? So then... I mean, he barely speaks in it. When well, you think speaks, about it. He speaks a language... He grunts unique, and... He speaks a language unique to John Belushi, which yeah. is the international language <laughs> of getting ready to bust your gut laughing. <laughs> and so... <laughs> it's very physical. So His the role. trade-off with Tannen was I had to go get a movie star to be, to be in the movie somewhere or it, quote, wasn't releasable, okay. unquote. All right. So that sent me on a scout for some kind of movie star. By a the movie way, star for what role? I mean, what, Well, what? that was a good question, too. We didn't know. 
the yeah. instruction was get a movie star. So the obvious place to bring a star in, because we had no money, remember. Mm -hmm. So who am I going to get to work, and how many days are they working? And so the professor, who has the affair with the Karen Allen character, mm -hmm. his role was two days. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. So get me a male lead who'll do this in two days. So I go to Donald Sutherland, his yeah. agent, and Donald yeah, himself. Right. I had worked earlier in Hollywood. I'd worked as a reader for Jane Fonda, and she had introduced me to Sutherland. I didn't know him well, but I knew him well enough to talk on the phone. Right. So he liked it. He liked the script. He thought it was funny. He thought yeah. it was outrageous. Yeah, he I can see him good, getting this. Good sense of humor. He totally got it. And yeah. he loved the idea of Landis, and he liked that something young and fresh and interesting was happening. All that was good. Mm -hmm. I said, we've got $20,000, 10000 a day. No points. He said, no, I won't do it. I've got to have a lot of points. I said, okay. How about four points and $20,000? He said, no, actually, you know, the points are not going to be worth anything. Yeah, because this is not going to make no, any money. So, so how about $100,000? And I said, well, I can't. I don't have $100,000. We finally settled on $50,000 flat for two days' work, 25000 a day. No points? No points. Really? So the points that Donald Sutherland passed up would be worth in nominally would be worth somewhere between 12 and 15 million dollars after amazing. the pictures released nevertheless i had donald solo and he was at that time a certifiable movie star sure clute had come out clute had come uh, out right yeah, that's right movies, sure you know yeah it was the guy was real and he was great yeah. and he did the movie and he felt very strongly that he should do the scene where he's naked from behind. Right. And as he reaches up to the thing, and yeah. he should, anyway, he contributed. He's a free spirit. He, and he's a great guy. Yeah. And he contributed <laughs> like great. mad to making the picture. That's fantastic. So, now I've dodged the bullet with having other executives in the company take the movie over. We have to find a place to shoot the damn thing. Right. It is summer, and it's a good time to shoot this movie since it's set in the summer. Right. Summer goes by, 11 colleges and universities turn us down. So where do you go? You go to all the uh, usual suspects, Harvard or Yale? Uh, no, well, you can't even don't, don't even, even So, so don't you even didn't bother. forget about that. So what did, yeah. who's, who turned you down? Are so you? we got turned down University of Pennsylvania, Duke University, of course. University of North Carolina. We got turned down at uh, Wake Forest College in Winston-Salem. We got turned down by UCLA, USC, well, you, we can, turned down. you can imagine they read the script. Well, I know. That was the mistake. <laughs> the mistake was they all asked for the script, and we were foolish enough to let them read it. <laughs> of course. Purely by accident, University at or of Oregon at Eugene had a campus. Yeah. And they had a wonderful woman whose name, I believe, was Betty Boyd, who was president of the school. Right. Betty Boyd had been a senior administrative executor at Berkeley when Berkeley turned down their location for the graduate mm. and she remembered that right the graduate ended up using usc as berkeley right so rather than make that mistake again she actually said yes so hell we were headed did for she Eugene, read Oregon. the script i have no idea i don't really i don't want to know okay because let's say it might be <laughs> i mean it's exculpatory evidence that she said yes but i right. just say in general you want to say Hopefully she didn't read it too closely. I guess not. And she <laughs> okay. also gave us her office to use as Dean Wormer's office. Oh, that was the, the office film. where like the horse died and the whole thing? Dean Wormer's office. Really? Office of the president of the University oh, of wow. Oregon at Eugene. God bless her. Because Whoa. we would not have made it. And by now, summer had eluded us. We didn't start shooting the damn thing in the summer until October in Oregon. Right. October through December in Oregon is not famous for sunshine. So if you take a hard look at Animal House these days, you'll see that there are kind of clouds and yeah. rain clouds and yeah. gray light and stuff like that. So we've worked hard to try to get past Yeah, that. even the parade thing is not brightly lit, is it? It's no, kind it of... No, it was um, raining that day. Yeah. <laughs> what can I say? And, and so we're off trying to get this movie made. Um, you've, got big, you've got people who became stars, I would say that. Well, the casting was its own adventure, Bill, because we had... Um, a casting director at Universal, whose name I won't use, very nice man, but he was still rooted in, you know, he still thought Rock Hudson was a big movie star. Yeah, right. You know, so 
I found some young casting guys, uh, Don Phillips and Michael Chinich. I was using them extensively. They had worked as extra casting for Sidney Lumet on things like Dog Day and Serpico. Right. And they had a sense of the street, and they were the right age. And they started pulling together interesting people. I think Bonnie Timmerman also helped out on that in some, know that some, name. At sure. some point. Mm-hmm. And so Kevin Bacon. So Kevin and Bacon's in this. That's right. First big role. First big role. Karen, Tim, Tim Karen, Matheson is in this. Tim, Tim Matheson, Tim Matheson is, really, uh, is really the star of the movie in he many is, ways. He is. And Tim, what a dream. Tim yeah. Matheson is. Nice guy. Oh, great guy. Easy to work with. Totally on it. Karen Allen. Karen Allen, a lovely. Did, yeah, no, I really like her. Spielberg uses her in the, uh, um, the Raiders, Raiders film. Raiders, that's and, right. Yep. And, and so. Peter Rieger. That's Peter Rieger. Fantastic. Wonderful. Fantastic guy. And how does John Vernon, uh, who's, you can't imagine Dean Wormer as anyone but John Vernon. At the same time, I'm sure even then, John Vernon was not a name. He was not a name. Uh, Landis had in mind someone else. I've forgotten who now. I'll think of that. But he had in mind someone else, a much better known actor to play this, but they wouldn't do it. And so. Well, you can't imagine anybody else. You can't, yeah. you can't, you can't imagine. He's so, he's so pompously way, I, perfect. I should also say. If you have a chance in life to make a picture, always make it with John Landis. Yeah. John Landis is so damn smart about filmmaking. Yeah. And he's so full of native curiosity and great yeah. ideas. He called me and he said, Verna Bloom. I said, what? Verna Bloom? Verna Bloom was known at the time as a fine actress, quote mm-hmm. unquote. Mm-hmm. Verna Bloom's going to play Mrs. Wormer? The Dean, Dean Wormer's wife? She's going to do the scene with yeah. the, you know, the sexually suggestive scene in the, in yeah. the grocery store. She's going to be drunk in the car. Yeah. She's going to be half naked. She's going to be whatever. It's yeah. fabulous. Well, you know, I guess this is the case is you never know what stage someone is in their life. Yeah. And so they see us, maybe they're looking for something different, you know? And yeah. then obviously these, these people were also Tom Hulse is in this, who got like one of oh. the, one of the you know, uh, of, of, yeah. of Amadeus and yeah. uh, one of these, this, really the, the scene that stands out the most in my mind. And it's very funny. There are, scene, there are scenes in here, yes. in this movie, that you not only couldn't do today, you would have trouble in the theater if you laughed out loud at these scenes today. Right. I mean, it, it, there's, there's the, the, just, the, just the animal rights thing, the horse dying in the, 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 you know, you know, uh, yes. the, the, with the gunshot and the horse has a heart attack, that'd be, that would be, you, the, everybody would be all over that. Somebody, but the yeah. big scene, <laughs> and you know what I'm going to say, yes, is that he's sleeping with the dean's daughter. No, the mayor's daughter. The mayor's daughter. And, um, and it's somewhere at the end, near the end, she turns and says, well, they're in a sleeping bag. Yes. They're, they're in love. They are in love. And they're both. That makes it all right. And Thank you, Tom. And they're both virgins. <laughs> yes. And okay. they're talking about. Oh, again, that makes it fine. They're, they're <laughs> talking about their virgin status. And they're yeah. in a sleeping bag in the middle of the night in the football field. And right. he says, you know, I've never done this before. I'm sorry. I have to confess this before we try. I've mm-hmm. never done this before and all yeah. that stuff. And she looks at him and says, that's all right. I have to confess something, too. And he says, what's that? She says, I'm only 13. Yeah. Cut. Now. You know? At that mo- at that time, that was very funny. Hilarious, Still hilariously hilarious. funny. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to be, you'd have to kind of hide away and laugh at it now because now <laughs> that would not never make it into a movie. And well, it would, I mean, there's so many things that wouldn't make it into. Like a movie what else? Today. Give me give me something else that wouldn't make it in. So let's just say, well, here's a problem I had internally. My friend Mr. Tannen, yeah called me in and said, before you shoot this thing, take that nightclub scene, the Dexter Lake Club, and cut that out of the script. We're not going to have that in the movie. Because if we have that in the movie, black people will riot and burn the theaters down. Wait, why, why would they riot? Because he, Mr. Tannen thought that was deeply insulting to black people. Now, let me say, Ned Tannen knew plenty of black people, but his idea of black people was Miles Davis. Right. It was Sidney Poitier. Yeah, exactly. It was, I mean, he'd grown up in the Hollywood version of sure. black people who yeah. were older, more established, yeah. had great reputations, et cetera. Yeah. I'd just finished making things like Car Wash. I right. mean, I'm in a fucking car wash on the corner sure. of Rampart and Sixth yeah. with Richard Pryor and a bunch of actors you never heard of. Bill Duke was my idea of a great black actor. So. And also, the, the, the movie, and I think this, talk how, how far ahead of its time it is. This movie. 
shows white people wanting to be black people. Yes. See, which, you, which was, I think of as something that happened much after this, long after this. Oh, no. But this is it's the first time where they're like, I, I can't believe I know the leader of the band, the singer. Yes. He thinks I'm cool. I'm going to go to a black club. Yes. And we're going to be just as tight. And that's, to me, one of the funniest things in the it movie. Is is where the, it is very funny. The Dexter Lake Club is inspired by a lot of things. Yeah. Part of it was my experience at a place called the Varsity Inn. I grew up in North Carolina in Durham. And yeah. the Varsity Inn was adjacent to Duke University. And it was a black nightclub where black bands played all the time. It was filled with white Duke students. Right. And the idea that uh, this group, Otis Day and the Knights, had been someone who'd played a fraternity party, and as a result, our lead character said, Otis, my man. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> and Otis, of course, has a And Otis is looking like, at him like, who's Who that? the fuck is that? What is this about? <laughs> I still see so, that in that movie. That is so funny. So <laughs> let's just say here that Tannen was dogged about the Dexter Lake Club scene. Yeah. And it became a going, as you'll hear in the rest of this podcast, it became a constant source of irritation and conflict throughout the making of the movie and the completion of the movie. Yeah. I should also say that John Landis, and I can't say enough about John, John is a formidable talent. Right. Forget Kentucky Fried Movie, which is his piece is hilarious. Forget Animal House, which is terrific. Trading Places. Yeah. American Wilwolf in London. Fantastic. Smart movie. Yeah. His Twilight Zone piece, even despite the tragedy. Yeah. You know, how about the Thriller video? Oh, yeah. First video to ever cost a million dollars. But yeah. how damn good is the Thriller video changed music videos forever. Yeah. And made it abundantly clear that John was a bravura talent and still is. So you go to, you go to uh, uh, Oregon, I guess. Yeah. And you shoot this movie. And how, how long does it take you to shoot this film? So let's slow down here for okay, just a second. Okay, fine. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, you are. I, so I'm working at Universal, and I'm moving up in the ranks okay. quickly, uh, mostly because the pictures we are making and releasing actually make money. I mean, right. Car Wash made money. Right, sure. Nobody could believe we were making money with a, essentially a black motion picture, although obviously it was a rainbow coalition picture. Yeah. And that had been true of a number of films. The prior films were all making money. And... Mr. Wasserman had a very clear idea about how to run a movie studio. Mm -hmm. And he said more than once to me, he said, Tom, I'm not Irving Thalberg. That's your job. Mm -hmm. What I care about is that the store is making money. Mm -hmm. He called the studio the store. Mm -hmm. And if there's money coming over the transom, that's what we're here for. Right. And if there's not, then somebody else will be doing this job. Right. So that was pretty clear. Yeah, and you I, have your directive. I have my directive. Yep. And so I knew we couldn't lose the Dexter Lake Club. Right. I'd grown up in the South. I grew up around people of color. This was not a mystery to me. The idea that yeah. Ned thought this was insulting to black people just meant that Ned had not been on the street yeah. in decades. Yeah, and, I mean, if anything, the movie's insulting to white college people, but well, let's get that yes. clear. Well, as, as it should be, and insulting to fraternities. <laughs> exactly, and to that's who it's insulting to. And, and remember, this, this movie, people say, oh, no, you started gross-out humor with this yeah. movie. It's not true at all. Yeah. All we did was create a movie that's anti-authoritarian. Yeah, That's sure. all it's about. It's yeah. about getting even with the man, Yeah. pushing authority past their limit. And I, I think also the, the thing that appealed to me was that they were not at a cool fraternity. Oh, no. They, they were, were the at worst, the, the worst possible fraternity. Worst this is possible. where all the rejects get, yep. went to. So I, I thought I related to that. So now Sean Daniel uh, was a guy I went to CalArts with, very smart, Upper West Side, red diaper kid from New York. Um, Sean had been my right hand. He eventually became head of production, and eventually after I left, he became president of the company. Sean was terrific, really good at developing material. I assigned him this movie. He moved permanently to Oregon to make sure we got through this. Right. But I had to do some other things before we could get there. So, Bill, Ivan Reitman was a Canadian producer who had made some low-budget pictures and also worked with the Saturday Night Live gang and the National Lampoon gang in some radio broadcasts. And so he knew some of those guys mm -hmm. and was kind of accepted by them. And I brought Ivan in 
to work with Maddie Simmons, who was the producer, and Ivan became a producer as well, on the theory that Ivan was younger and smarter and on it and would help protect us. But then I had a, a secret weapon. I had an English line producing guy, unit manager or line producer, named Peter McGregor Scott. Peter McGregor Scott did 15 movies for me at Universal. Right. He did difficult, I always, he got the worst jobs. Yeah. I gave him jobs where there were no budget. I gave him jobs where the directors weren't experienced or the things that we had to pull off were almost impossible. Right. And Peter made it work 100% of the time. So I put him on this movie yeah. and Peter went to Oregon. And so you had Maddie mm -hmm. Simmons, who in Maddie's defense, knew nothing about producing a movie and learned something maybe mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. this time. And Ivan, who knew a lot more about producing a movie, and Peter, who was all the law west of the Pecos. Right. And he would get this thing done. And Sean was there full time. Yeah. So the movie proceeded. I think we started shooting in October. We finished at Christmas. Right. So we did maybe 35 days of shooting, something like that. Sure, yeah. $3 million budget. $3 million budget. And now we bring it back to the studio and we're in post. John Landis is very smart about everything in the relative to the movie, but he went out and recruited Elmer Bernstein to do the score. Now, Elmer Bernstein, yeah. he of To Kill a Mockingbird. Sure, yeah, he one of the great the composers. Great, great composers and great historic scores. Right. Not a single comedy in the guy's repertoire. Right. So, John, who I think knew Elmer... So why, too, did, he, why, did, he, why did John want Elmer when you go Ah, because John understood that this movie works best when there's um, contrarian information. When you think it's going left and it goes right, when you think it's going right and it goes left, yeah. it's a bigger laugh, it's funnier, it sets the tune, tone, it makes it wackier. And honestly... The music provides a sort of irony, doesn't it? Does. It does. And as you look at the opening, you see that yeah. that... that orchestral opening yeah. suggests that you're about to see a dignified documentary about Harvard. Right. Not quite the case. No, that is not the case. So, Elmer's on the picture. Then I recruited Kenny Vance. He of Jay and the Americans fame, but also Kenny's a wonderful singer, writer, performer in, right. on his own right, in his own right, and he had great taste. I should also point out here, by the way, I forgot, that we recruited John Landis's wife, Deborah, Deborah Duhlman, who has written the great book about costume design and has a PhD in that area. Mm -hmm. Deborah Duhlman and some other people on the movie, I've forgotten whom, maybe the location manager, mm -hmm. um, went to thrift shops in Eugene, Oregon to find the costumes. Oh. And we had no budget. Right. So they dressed people with whatever they found. They also sewed the original togas yeah. out of bed sheets for the toga party. Yeah. So all of this was kind of loving hands at home. We were cobbling this movie yeah, together. Yeah, well, handmade way movie. We could. That's right. Handmade movie. So remember that um, <laughs> um, we then have to preview the movie. Right. Let me yeah. stop here because this is. If anybody's ever listening to this, I just want them to know there is no more excruciating torture than a series of previews for a movie when all the studio brass show up and stand in a theater in fucking Des Moines, Iowa, or Shreveport, yeah. or someplace, and watch it and opine about it, and you have to take them seriously. Are they, are they watching it with, the, with, the, with select audiences? They are watching it with recruited audiences. So this is a research sort of thing. It's a this way of saying, how is this movie going to play in the middle of the country? In those days, in the benighted 70s and 80s, every studio basically worked the same way. Every Friday night and every Saturday night, you are in a different city with a cut of the movie, which was essentially the director's cut with some studio input. Right. And that movie was screened for a targeted audience, a selected audience, mm -hmm. which your marketing department had recruited and put together, and they then did cards that demonstrated whether the audience liked the picture or not. People filled out little reports and cards. Sure. Yeah, I remember and filling then, those things out. And yeah. then they did focus groups afterwards. Yeah. You keep 20 people or 30 right. people and ask them questions yeah. and all this stuff. This process was torturous because I've seen it go both ways. Sure. Let me just say... The single best preview 
I ever went to in my life was in the Waikiki Three in Honolulu for a film called Gable and Lombard. Right. It was one of the worst pictures I've ever seen. Yes, that's no a bad movie. No offense to anybody. Yeah. No offense to anybody. Nice people yeah, in the movie. Nice Jill, people, I'm sure. Joel Clayberg can act. People are nice. Yeah. James Brolin, James Brolin nice Brolin, lovely. Terrible damn movie. Yeah. So you don't really necessarily learn anything, but I assume that when you go to Iowa or wherever it is, you say, find me a bunch of rowdy college students. No. You, you don't? It doesn't work that way. So no. marketing determines a cross-section of people to put in the audience because they want to see, does it work for young people? Does it work for older people? Does it work better for women? Does it work better for men? 13% minority, whatever, you know, blah, blah, oh. blah. And so that's already deeply misleading. You I'm going to say, you know, whenever you do a, a show, um, oh, let's say something as specific as what I've, I've done a lot of my, my career, uh, like The View, uh, you, you go, you carve out people who actually watch daytime television. Right. They are specifically women, because those are the ones that you're trying to reach. At least that was the case when I was doing it. Mm -hmm. And so you sort of hedge your bets a little bit. They have to be people who are at home. And, and it's you're, you're saying you don't do that with a movie. You're just trying to get a handle on your, whether old people, young people, Who's black, white, whatever. Yeah. Because remember, you will spend more on marketing than you spent on the negative. Right. Well, particularly in this case. Yeah, particularly right? in this case, but yeah. I mean, even on a on a big movie. Yeah. You know, and and by the way, remember, then these days you could still make a movie for a reasonable price. Right. I mean, we spent about twelve million dollars making E.T. Right. You know, right? And Is so, that right? Yeah. So wow. So how about that? Yeah, I know. And we <laughs> made it off the lot to save money because sure. again, we terrible. And my management, Sid Scheinberg, and nobody believed in it. No, ET was hated by senior management at Universal. They said it was a movie for children and we should not make it. But they were all afraid to bet against Spielberg. Yeah. Because of Jaws. We have to really. do that. We're going to do, we're going to do one. Uh, stay with us, folks. We will be doing E.T. eventually. We'll get to that. Uh, right. but, okay, so you take so, this out. So we, we take it out, and we're doing previews in various cities. There is a little production reel, 10 minutes, 8 minutes, that uh, Landis put together that we send out to distributor, uh, to our people that uh, book theaters for us to show to distributors on the theory that maybe we'd get some theaters. We sent 20 of them out. You know, the head of distribution at Universal at this time was a not very nice man named Henry Martin. Henry H. R. High Martin. Mm -hmm. High Martin was a Texas cracker who had started in the um, sound disc distribution business mm -hmm. just as sound was coming in and mm -hmm. was still running Universal's distribution. He did not like me. Mm -hmm. He didn't like the kids I was hiring. He thought we were all communists. Mm -hmm. Maybe we were, I don't know, but I never asked. But then he thought making this movie at all was ridic ridiculous. Yeah. And in a group meeting with all the senior executives, he gave me a big lecture about how nobody would ever go see this Animal House thing because college was for rich kids. College was for highfalutin people <laughs> and the idea of fraternities were even more effete. Mm -hmm. So nobody goes to a fraternity unless they have a lot of money and are elite. And as a result, there's no real audience for this movie. Why would you make it? Mm. So obviously, <laughs> High Martin hadn't been to college yeah. <laughs> in about 50 years. Yeah, Maybe he right. never went. I don't know. I, yeah. Anyway, I was not happy about this guy, and he was a constant problem. So just getting it released in a reasonable number of theaters. However... It gets worse. <laughs> While we're trying to get our act together to release the movie, there are a bunch of issues. One issue is, what does the one sheet look like? What's the advertising for this movie? Mm -hmm. So finally, someone in our, and I've forgotten the man's name, nice guy, uh, who was an artist in our advertising department, tried the idea of drawing a cartoon of the Delta House with all of the characters, and that became the illustration for the one sheet. Mm -hmm. We tried photographs of Belushi and other cast members, mm -hmm. all kinds of things, all terrible. Didn't in any way communicate the fun of the movie. Right. You know, because whatever you think about Animal House, if you're insulted by it today, if you're going to be canceled because you watch it, I urge you to draw the drapes in your house before you run it. Right. The um, upshot is it will make you laugh. Sure. No matter who you are. No matter where you come from, mm -hmm. no matter where you think you're going in life, yeah. 
this is a funny movie, and it's a yeah. smart movie. It also is the opposite of an elitist movie. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's the, your, the, no one would see that movie and say that's at, you're you're going for an upscale audience. That so, is not the case. So Sean <laughs> and myself and John Landis and a number of other people associated with this movie at Universal, we were constantly aware that at any second we might all get fired. Right. There was that feeling in the company. All the senior executives, even though I'd now become, by the time this is out, I'm just becoming president of the company, but right. it doesn't matter. I'm still an outsider mm -hmm. in the old boys club of Universal. Right. The Jennings Langs of the earth, all these people, they were not happy that we were there and they were not happy that we're taking the company in the direction of a lot of comedy. And remember, at this moment, not only are we making Animal House, we're now making movies with Lily Tomlin and Cheech and Chong yeah. and yeah. Richard Pryor and, and long yeah. Andy Kaufman. Counterculture. Yeah, a totally different right. tectonic shift in the culture. So we have a preview and party afterwards, which is not really a legit preview, but it's the first time Tannen has seen the finished movie. Mm -hmm. It's in New York. We have a party in a club somewhere downtown after, which mm -hmm. I've forgotten where. I think mm -hmm. it was maybe the Gaslight or someplace. And uh, he watches the movie. The audience loves the movie. Right. By the way, the cards on this movie were phenomenal. Yeah. In the world of cards, if you have a, a rating of about 85% very good and excellent on the cards, that's a releasable film has a chance mm -hmm. of being a hit. Sure. If it's better than that, it's mm -hmm. astonishing. We were running 90, 93% so, on the cards. So it previewed so really well. It previewed really well. That's great. With kids. It previewed really well with kids. And the adult who ended up accidentally in there couldn't help themselves. They ended up laughing. Yeah, too. it had to be infectious to be around all those kids laughing. So Tannen sees this film. We go to the party. Everybody's drinking a lot. I don't drink, so I'm, as usual, the designated driver. I'm standing around. Ned comes up to me and says, you son of a bitch. Mm. I said, okay, what did I do? Mm -hmm. He said, you didn't take the Dexter Lake Club scene out. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, black people are going to rip the seats out of the theater. We're going to have to pay for all that damage. Mm. <laughs> I said, Ned, they will love it. He said, no, they won't. Mm. They won't love it. And you're going to take it out. And then I think he might have been a little drunk. I'm not sure. Yeah. He shoved me up against the wall, put his arm up against my chest really held me against the wall and said you're gonna take that fucking scene out blah 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 or you're fired the and black nightclub scene yeah you want he wants taken out yes. which is basically the culmination of the joke from the toga party scene yeah of course this is essentially that's that yeah, two, scene sets up that joke multiple parts yep okay wow so in any so event, you get a little roughed up and I get on a plane the next day and go back to California. I go to see Richard Pryor, who mm -hmm. I have a great relationship with. I've made films with him now several mm -hmm. times, and we're close. And I show the picture to Richard. Uh -huh. And I said, Richard, you have to tell me if this is racist, because if you tell me it's racist, I'll take it out. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to listen to some white guy whose yeah. concern is whether the waves are too high at his Malibu yeah. beach house. Yeah. You know. So... Richard looks at it and he said, Tom, it's fucking funny. It's just funny. Mm -hmm. So I put him on the phone with Tannen, who can't not take Richard Pryor's call. Of course. And Pryor's making a lot of money for the studio in those days and a lot of movies. And he just says, Ned, I saw the damn thing. It's just fucking funny. And I've been black a lot longer than you have. <laughs> and so... That's great. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. One of the many things Richard Pryor did for me, and I did some for him. As that's, well. that's one of those things. It's like, like uh, black people will hate it. Oh, yeah? Well, my friend Richard Pryor wants to speak with you about <laughs> it. <laughs> well, you know. You've got to love listen, that. Come on. Bill. That's great. It's a rough environment. <laughs> I bet it's, it is. It is a rough environment. It is the movie business <laughs> unvarnished. All these guys. Remember, Wasserman and Jules Stein owned the majority share of the studio. Yeah. They were not just running it. They owned the fucking yeah. thing. Yeah. And so, you know, everybody below them understood that you had to fucking toe the line. You had to do stuff. And by yeah. the way, just for the record, I got fired four times before I left Universal. And every time I got fired, I would go down to Seal, my secretary, and say, well, so-and-so just fired me. Mm -hmm. And she'd say, yeah, let's just keep going. 
Yeah. And I go back to my office, go back to work, and I never hear about it again. So <sighs> strange as that. Yeah. So, so 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 let me take you to. It's really it, we we're, we're now. I think I'm in order here. You can just stop me if I'm going too fast. Yeah. We're or now we're releasing the movie on in, in 1978. You're yes. releasing this film. What, what, what time of year are you releasing this movie? Uh, we're releasing it in July, I think. It, so I it's a summer know. movie. It's a summer movie. It's an escapist, fun, college summer movie. And, and what, what are, I assume there are reviews. Oh, yeah, there are reviews. So reviews are generally not very good for the movie. Right. But I'm used to that. Yeah. You know, I remember. I don't I, think of this movie as getting good reviews. No, it didn't get good reviews. But we found one reviewer in particular who became our champion. Yeah. And that was the most important reviewer in America at that time, Roger Ebert. Yeah, he had a, he had a good sense of what. He did. He loved movies and even that kind of movie. I yeah, could see him. That's right. And he was on radio and he was on television. He was in print and yeah. he was everywhere. Siskel and Ebert were a big deal. Yeah. And Roger Ebert saw the movie and said, best comedy of the year, best comedy I've seen in years. Yeah. You've got to go see I this movie. I could see movie. Ebert. See, because Siskel always said, we're museum curators. You know, right. Siskel was that kind of reviewer. Right. Ebert was not that. No, no, no. Ebert was a man of the people. That's right. He saw a movie. If he loved it, he loved it, and it was great. And he, uh, he was great. I must say, he was great to work with. So we released the movie. Before we released the movie, we had had a series, a small series of previews in certain cities just to see if we could build up a little excitement about the movie pre-release. In other words, if we were going to release on a Friday, maybe on a Wednesday night, mm -hmm. we'd have a recruited preview just to see if the word would spread in the local community. So one of those places we did that was the Century 21 in suburban Denver. Okay? Okay. So we had our preview there, our kind of a marketing preview. It wasn't a research preview. It was just for marketing purposes. And I think you went to some of those when you were a young man. In oh, I did. I, I went. I went to several of your movies. I, I remember okay. uh, Deer Hunter. I, oh, I yeah. specifically went to the Oklahoma City because all the all media premiere yeah, in Oklahoma that. City of, of Deer Hunter. The country. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know if you worked on The Shining, but I did the same thing with The Shining. Yeah. Did not work on The okay, Shining. Okay, but they but did that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, that, that's the studios constantly yeah. trying to gather up groups of opinion makers in right. local communities that would at least give us some water cooler talk before we opened it. Right. So on Friday, that movie opened at the Century at the uh, Century 21, suburban Denver. And there was a line of kids out the door, down the mall and around the block. Ah. That picture ran in that theater over a year. Wow. They never shut it off. It just ran. We had to keep giving them new prints because they just degrade. Wore them down, yeah. yeah. They just degrade and come apart. Isn't that amazing? And and that was a good example of what happened to that picture in the college youth community in sure. the U.S. It also, by the way, not only did it push John Landis's career ahead in remarkable ways, and yeah. John, of course, made great movies. Shortly thereafter, we did Blues Brothers with John and, and um, American Werewolf in, Werewolf in London, which sure. we distributed. And, uh, when, when this makes a lot of money... Uh, 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 um, We'll get to exactly how much money in a second. When this makes a lot of money, that next, do you walk into Universal like, you know? No. Uh, no. Take that, bitches. No, 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 no. Come no, on. No, 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 no. That's no, what no. I'd do. So Mr. Wasserman's attitude about Animal House was his same attitude he had about Smokey and the Bandit, the same attitude he had about Car Wash, the same attitude he had about The Deer Hunter, for which we won six Academy Awards, right. in addition to making a ton of movies, the same attitude he had about E.T., uh, just do that again. Yeah, just do it again. Just do it again. Make some more money. Just do that. Yeah. Just keep doing whatever that is. Just do yeah. that again. Right. And so. So you knew better than to go in. And I, there was no room no, for that. I no was, look at me. No look at me and no, what I've done. I, other studios gave their production executives credit on films. Mm -hmm. You would sometimes see from a UA picture or others, you'd say supervised by so-and-so. Yeah, sure. Universal never did any of that. No executives ever got a screen credit. Right. I asked Mr. Wasserman about that over lunch. He said, Tom, you are only famous to your mother until she's dead. <laughs> and so oh, that's a good point. I thought, a lot of wisdom in that. I'm not complaining. 
listen, they let me run a movie studio. They let me run it for a long time. Right. It was the greatest gift. It was the greatest way to grow through your 20s and into your 30s right. that I could possibly imagine. I mean, so, so let's, let me keep going here. Okay, go ahead. The other thing that happened is we opened Animal House in a tiny number of theaters. I think we might have had 50 or 100 screens really? in the beginning. Nothing. Mm -hmm. And screens slotted near colleges around on the theory that that would be the only audience mm -hmm. for this. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, we moved to 500 screens because even Henry H.R. High Martin yeah. understood that this was money in the bank. You're right. And he also felt, as he said to me many times, that this was more or less the death of good filmmaking. So, so you, you wrecked the culture single-handedly. We, we, John Landis and Sean Daniel <laughs> and the boys from the National yeah. Lampoon, yeah. myself and John Belushi, single-handedly wrecked the integrity of the film business, which, by the way, never had any integrity <laughs> never, yeah, to, I gonna say to it's begin a, with. So I, what are we talking I, I think about? you're off the hook on that one. So um, let me keep go, going. Okay, go ahead. I'm about to ask you how much money this thing made, I'm, which I'm, I'm trying to get there. To get there. I'm, I'm trying to get I'm to exactly how much money uh, Animal right. House made. So it cost us three million bucks. Right. Our advertising cost us probably three and a half, four million dollars for the picture. Right. It's all we spent on right. advertising. Yeah. The picture in its first round, meaning its first national release in the U.S. only, first national release, U.S. only, and gross, I'm now going to go to a gross number, in that round, and of course there are many subsequent releases, et cetera, $141 million. Oh my gosh. In those days. In those days. That was the most successful comedy in Hollywood history. Right. And it was one of the most successful R-rated pictures ever across right. all categories. Right. And beyond that, it also played in a lot of other places. And it kept getting re-released. And the other thing that was great about that movie is after a, you know, booking has a terminus. You book somebody, something in somebody's theater and you book it for six weeks or two weeks or 12 weeks. And then you have to pull it out and another movie comes in. The minute that second movie was gone, they'd take it back. Animal House wouldn't die. Yeah. It just kept just going. Just kept hanging on. And then on. it became, you know, in everybody's top, 10 or 20 or whatever yeah. list. All of a sudden, it's a good movie. I mean, all of a sudden, it's a good movie and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, By that the happens. way, still disreputable because yeah. when, and I never forgive them for this, as much as I like the American Film Institute, when the American Film Institute decided to do their list of the 100 best comedies ever made, a mm -hmm. lot of great films on that list. Sure. Animal House is number 36. Ah. My view is Animal House should be in the top 20. Yeah. But... People are offended by Animal House. John Belushi spits food all over everybody. Yeah. A horse dies and is cut up yeah. with a chainsaw by a janitor. Yeah. Things yeah. happen. 13-year-old girl about to have sex. That's well, absolutely. right. Absolutely. Happily. Yeah. Happily. Yeah, yes. that's right. Clorette. Clorette de Pesto. <laughs> Clorette da de Pesto. Daughter of. <laughs> the mayor. Mayor de Pesto. The mayor de Pesto. Carmine de Pesto. <laughs> and so. Yeah, Wow. Now something else begins to happen, and that is everybody's career takes off. Yeah. Kevin Bacon goes from being nobody to being Kevin Bacon. Right. Everybody who's associated with the movie begins to prosper. The writers have tons of offers to do all kinds of things. Some of them capitalize on it. Mm -hmm. A tragedy happens almost immediately. Um, so we're... we're um, Looking to, f we're trying to, Sean and I are trying to figure out if we should do, oh, I should also add something here. Sean Daniels, great guy, terrific executive, great producer, has a younger brother named Josh who wants to be an actor. So we put Josh in Animal House. Mm -hmm. Josh Daniel, he's probably in two or three movies in his life before he took another direction. But, but I love the idea that people were that this was such a familial enterprise. Mm -hmm. All of us had gone to school together. All of us knew each other. All of us hung out. We dated the same girls. They fired us, period. All the same, you know, the same people that were every conceivable combination of personal intertwining happened in this crew of kids who gradually got bigger and bigger. 
John Landis started making much bigger pictures, much more expensive pictures, and very, very successful pictures. Great films. Landis is great and totally unfairly tarred and feathered for the tragedy associated with Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone, that's right. Yeah, the, the, the Vic Morrow. Yeah, uh, I went to court and testified on his behalf in right. that thing. In any event, um, so what I really want to say here, and I'll wrap this up about Animal House, is sometimes by accident, by divine intervention, by sheer happenstance, or by dint of a lot of other people's good creative hard work, right. you do something, Bill, that changes the culture. You did that when you created The View. Should there were many of us. Barbara was, was well, Barbara. Of the, yeah, but, but yeah, but here, we, we were involved. Yes, I didn't do this by myself. Sure, I had writers and directors and yeah. people. Sean yeah. and I, all yeah. this stuff. Everybody contributed. Yeah. Everybody no. worked like a. And dog. there's no question the culture changes with, with certain types of projects. The culture does change. It takes a turn. Yep, and after Animal House, there were a zillion fraternity movies. Each oh of yeah. Them fanc fancifully hoping to capture our magic didn't happen. Right. Because they came from the wrong place. Yeah. You know, they came from gross out humor, which was never what this was about. No. This was entirely about the idea that um, there were some very rational solutions to adult problems. In other words, uh, if there's really a problem and you can't do anything about it, what's the best solution? Road trip. Right. Yeah, <laughs> right. If, uh, if uh, you're in a spot where um, your behavior is suspect, the adult will say, you know, son, going through life uh, fat, drunk, and stupid is not a good plan. Mm. Things like that. Yeah. It's, um, it's a movie that kind of sets the bar high for the idea of comedy that's satirical and edgy. Yeah. And by the way, out of this comes Ghostbusters, out of this comes Caddyshack, out of this comes a million sure. other things, and changes what's defi defined yeah, there'd as be no, uh, culture. There would be no Ferrelli brothers without yep, the uh, uh, Animal House. You know what I mean? That, the, all that stuff is... Well, yeah. um, and so, it, 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 and, and I assume that it's something you're very proud of. Because, yeah. because, it, because I think any time you have that much impact on the culture, because basically... Basically, all you're doing is tapping into something that's already there. That's great. That's right. You know, yes. that's what you're doing. People say, well, you, you, you destroy this, this, you know, this and that. It's like, you know, it's already there. I'm, I'm just pointing it out. I'm actually pointing the way, and people are already inclined to come along on the ride for this because that's where the culture is going anyway. Correct. Right? And that's the whole point. Listen, we had a team. I had hired a team of people my age or younger to run this studio, we had t-shirts that said, we'll sleep when we're dead. Yeah. You know, we worked 12, 14 hours a day every day. We worked six days a week. It never yeah. occurred to us. Yeah. The, the motto was, you know, if you're not willing to come in on Saturday, don't bother to come yeah. in on Sunday. Yeah. We used to, at Good Morning America, we used to say, sleep is for sissies. That's right. Yeah, or, uh, or um, we wear our exhaustion like a badge. Yes. It's like, you think you're tired? Yeah. No. That's right. I'm tired. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, thank you for sharing this with us. Do you have anything else? Do you want, to, want any, any, no, anything else? I think we're done. I don't want. I don't want to shut you down. No, you're not doing that at all. Okay. I think it's because I, I. I think this is fascinating. We could go on about Animal I, House. I know we could. Details forever, but oh, I wanted to say one more thing. There was yeah. one more thing I neglected okay, go for to it. say. I neglected to tell the story of Dwayne Jesse. Okay. D Wayne D E W A Y N E D Wayne Jesse D Wayne Jesse is an actor who appeared in. The first picture I did at Universal called the Bingo Long Traveling All Stars and Motor sure. Kings yeah. with James Earl Jones, Richard Pryor, and Billy yeah. D. Yeah. Williams. And then he appeared in Car Wash for me. Right. And Dwayne Jesse was a wonderful character. He played Otis Day of oh, Otis yes. Day in the Nights oh, yeah. in the Dexter Lake Club. Yeah, sure. In that sequence. Yeah. After the Sing film was shout. a hit. And saying shout. After yeah. that the film was a hit. Right. Dwayne came to see me at Universal in the office and said, I've got this idea. I want to go out on the road. It's a way I can make a living. I'm never going to make a living as an actor. Mm -hmm. And he's right. He was always going to get secondary parts. It wasn't, uh, you know, he's a funny looking guy. Yeah, he's an unusual looking guy. Yeah, and, and he's a great guy. Yeah. He's got a great heart and great spirit. 
Mm-hmm. So I dragged him over to business affairs, and much to the dismay of our lawyers, I forced them to make a deal which granted him the right to take the name Otis Day and the Knights in perpetuity as long as he's alive yeah. and take that band out and perform as Otis Day and the Knights from Animal House. Ah. And he's still out there performing. Is that right? He is still out there performing. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. and so I'm just saying anybody out there has a party upcoming, they should get a hold of Otis Day and the Knights <laughs> and, and the Knights invite them your, uh, to come. Your bar mitzvah. That's right. <laughs> now I can't leave that plug out because Dwayne Jesse is a wonderful guy and he deserves That's really every cool. bit of Every bit and of it's success. interesting how many lives you change, isn't it? Just well, so something that because you know you, it, movies are funny because you, you you come. It's not like television; like we all live together for years. Right? Movies you all come together for a short period of time, right? And go away, and sometimes it doesn't impact on you at all. Yeah. And other times it completely changes the direction of everyone's career. It's quite crazy, you know. I have people come up to me all over the place as I wander around. And they'll use a line from Animal House or they'll use a line from Blues Brothers. Sure. Or they'll use a line from Bull Durham or from other things we've done. And it's um, kind of great. I could do this forever, but I can't because we have to wrap it up. Um, thank you for sharing all thank this. Thank you very much, Bill. And it's great to be hanging out here with you in the universe of Take Fountain. <laughs> okay. Once again, remember there are no shortcuts. In the world of show business, but there are many, many detours. This is Bill Getty with Tom Mount, advising you to take fountain. See you next time. <laughs>